following podcast will contain spoilers and explicit language. Hello and welcome to episode five of Yeah, It's That Bad. My name is Joel. And I'm Martin. And I'm Carissa. Tonight's movie, with a 40% on Rotten Tomatoes, is 2001's Vanilla Sky. This film is an interpretation of the 1997 Spanish movie Abre los Ojos, also known as Open Your Eyes, the screenplay for which was written by Alejandro Amenabar and Mateo Gill. The film stars Tom Cruise and Penelope Cruz in a repeat performance from Abre los Ojos and Cameron Diaz with Jason Lee and Kurt Russell. Vanilla Sky has been described as an odd mixture of science fiction, romance, and reality warp. Part beautiful people fantasy, part new age investigation of the great beyond, a love story and a struggle for the soul, and an erotic adventure, romance, mystery, and psychological thriller with a dose of science fiction. Let's uh, start this off with a quick plot synopsis. David Ames takes all he has for granted, his wealth, his inherited publishing company, his good looks, and his relationships, especially his relationships. It catches up to him when a friend, sometimes sex partner, can't see their relationships the way he sees it. From that point, the movie takes a Lynchian twist that ultimately and literally pulls us into Ames' tortured psyche. Okay, Martin, this movie is almost 10 years old, or I think it is 10 years old, and I think we both have seen this multiple times. Chris, have you ever seen this before? No, this is my first time viewing it. Okay, that's perfect. Martin, what did you think the first time you saw this movie? It was confusing going into it. Nobody had spoiled it for me, and nobody even insinuated that there was some kind of twist the first time I saw it. So I was going into it completely blind, as hopefully anybody who sees it and hasn't seen it yet would go into it that way. That's that's the best way to approach it. I never found the movie boring at any point. It never lost my attention. It was, it was similar to uh, Fight Club. Fight Club never lost my attention, even though the ending was kind of like a keystone, like a, uh, like a key to piece the movie together. That was how I felt about the movie the first time I saw it. Well, I had a slightly different opinion than you did. The first time I saw this movie, I did not like it. I thought it was kind of like pointless. I didn't understand what was happening. It wasn't until the ending and that last piece of the puzzle fell in that I just fell in love with this movie. I love that ending. I think that ending is Cream fantastic. How about this as far as Tom Cruise goes? T2 Toast. What? From Mission Impossible, like when he had to do the voice recognition as he was being lowered into the room, he had that stupid thing. He's like, T2. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I don't remember that movie. I don't remember that movie at all. I wiped that (laughs) out. I've seen Mission Impossible 3 recently, but I haven't seen that one. So I don't don't know what the hell you're talking about. I I wish you didn't see Mission Impossible 3. It's good. It's a lot better than Mission Impossible 2. Yeah, it is for sure. J.J. Abrams. All right, whatever. Chris, what did you think of Vanilla Sky while you were watching it since this is your first viewing? I thoroughly enjoyed it. I didn't think that the ending was too predictable. If they had stuck to the original uh, title and the original translation of Open Your Eyes, which was a reoccurring line throughout the movie, I think it would have been better than Vanilla Sky because at one point you you look at the sky and you can tell it looks dreamlike. But besides that, you you can't really tell where the story is going to head to and you are trying to piece it together throughout the entire, uh, entire piece. And it's definitely a movie you'd have to watch again. So, Carissa, you were, you were saying that the scene where he woke up after he was drunk at the nightclub, he woke up on the uh, on the street there after very heavy drinking, and the sky is very vibrant. It's supposed to be the sunrise because it's early in the morning, but you were saying that it, that it looks surreal and dreamlike, and you're like, you whisper it to me, you go, this is a dream. That fucking drove me nuts because you fucking figured it out, and you're saying... That it's because it's called Vanilla Sky, and you're like, well, it looks like vanilla. The sky's vanilla. Well, that's you know, that's an, <laughs> that is an interesting question. Like, have you seen a movie before where there's a mystery plot, and because you figure it out before the movie's over, that that detracts from it? I can think of one movie that I saw in the past that that happened to me. How about it, you? What it, is it? Uh, the Village. M. Night Shyamalan's The Village. I figured, figured out what the, I figured out what the twist exactly was within the first ten minutes. Yeah, I nailed it, and I I, I I threw my head back in shock and disgust when I was right. I was like, no, did, yeah, that ruined the movie for me. Yes, did you throw like rotten cabbages at the uh, screen? You're like, no. I wish I brought my vaudeville box of rotten <laughs> fruit so I can throw it. No, can you think of anything that has ever happened to you before? Yeah, this movie right now where 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 it was ruined for me. <laughs> on the fifteenth viewing by Carissa, but because she figured it out, that ruined it for me. Like, no, were you just upset that you didn't figure it out on your first try? Was that it? That's that absolutely jealous part of it. Yes. It could be envy. 
it didn't ruin the movie for me at all. I think you can get so much more from this movie, the uh, actual meaning behind the dreams and being... Whoa, 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 wait. We'll, we'll, we'll get into the metaphysical and the, and, and the story and, and, and the different aspects of this movie later because I think that we should probably talk about something more, super, I guess, superficial, like the acting and the uh, different aspects of the movie like that before we jump into... Go down that. All right, fine. Let's, that, that rabbit hole, because I, I got a shit ton to say about that. Okay, fine. All right. Uh, let's talk about the directing. I, Cameron Crowe, right? Jerry, is, Jerry Maguire. Cameron Crowe's guy, he, he did um, Almost Famous, which is a movie that everyone says is amazing. I, I didn't like. You know, He also made Elizabeth Town, which is considered to be a horrendous movie. So maybe we could review that in this podcast. So <laughs> me and that guy, we kind of don't see eye to eye all the time. But I love this movie. I love what he did in it. Some of the shots were really, really well made. Like that, that whole opening sequence in Times Square looked incredible. No one's going to argue that. Yes. And uh, like shots when he is walking down the street, when he leaves Penelope Cruz's apartment and uh, the sky is all pink and... Everything is like covered, and reflective, and with water and everything. It's that was beautiful. Him where he was in the foyer at the end of the movie, where there were no people, it was just his reflection in the glass doors of the foyer, and it was shot probably thirty, forty feet up in the air on a boon crane. Just looking at this man, he looks so isolated and alone. What do you think, Chris? Uh, the way this movie looked. It was beautifully done. I like the transition, some of them very abrupt, but for the most part, uh, they they transitioned well. They had great scene shots, especially the ones of the city. He, he really was isolated the entire time. No one really stood out to you uh, in the background. It was primarily focused on his character and his character developing into a more deranged man. I want to take a moment to talk about the sound the music and the sound design in this movie because it's definitely worth noting. The soundtrack in this movie is incredible, right? It fits so well with the overall emotional content of every scene in this movie. It's uh, pretty flawless. And yeah, I'm a little biased because I like a lot of the bands and I liked them before this movie came out. What do you think, Chris? I love the soundtrack. I feel that it didn't stick out in your mind too much it just was a subtle little influence on what was going on and it fit in every scene i've owned the soundtrack to this movie for many years and i've listened to it throughout the years and it's this great mixture of like really sad songs but really upbeat ones as well so they did an extremely good job with the soundtrack to this movie another thing that i really loved is the sound design in this movie and it's stuff that kind of goes over your head the first time you watch it but every time i see this movie i i hear new things that they add in the background like do you notice all those like the numbers that people are chanting and stuff nine zero you know you know what that is it sounds like somebody's reciting a telephone number no i i can tell you exactly what that that is okay what those numbers are is okay get this in the world there exists you, you know shortwave radio yes right so if you were a shortwave radio enthusiast and you like it's your thing to look for weird stations from around the world, right? Well, people have discovered that there are these radio stations that all they do at certain times of the day are recite numbers like that. Like you turn to this radio station and it's just three, four, eight, nine, like that. Like just just a string of numbers. It's very it's very mysterious. I think I know a little bit about those though, because a lot of people I think what you're talking about deals with in the cold war, America and Russia would have spies and they would send codes. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people believe that that's what that is. No. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what it is. And that's, yeah, the majority of people believe that that's how governments communicate with their spies is through these weird numbers because they, they have the, the way to crack the code is almost completely unbreakable except for the, the spy himself. He's the only one who can crack the code, which is pretty interesting when you think about that in context of the movie. Like his subconscious is trying to tell him something, but only he can crack it, but he doesn't understand it. I think that's pretty clever. I think that's extremely clever. I notice new things every time I view this movie. The one thing I noticed in this viewing was when he, uh, when tech support, I guess, uh, Noah Taylor? Yeah. When he gestures out Almost at the audience, he says, your panel of observers are waiting for you to make your decision, even now. 
and I was. I was waiting for him to make his decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. That's that and then and then and they glance out and just like look straight out at I, I guess at at where the audience would be. So I was like, is this a fourth wall breakdown kind of situation? That was something new I noticed. I thought that was really cool. I also noticed that during the scene where his uh, where the the splice happens. So yeah, we're we're kind of just like talking about these things and not explaining anything of what's going on. And so we're not, but I hope everyone's seen this movie because it's really good. Okay, so basically to to spoil this movie, I think I think I can spoil this movie in a sentence. Like um, the whole plot of this movie, Tom Cruise's character is living his life. He gets into a car accident. It disfigures him. From that point on, he has a lot of trouble regaining his life and his career and everything and he becomes eventually he becomes framed for murder all these bad things just start spiraling out of control out of control and then in the end it's revealed that ultimately he had died several hundred years ago and the whole movie is taking place inside of a cryogenic tube inside of his mind yeah whatever and get it's all, right yeah and it's all inside of his mind and the whole movie was a delusion it was a lucid dream and he was controlling everything for a dream to be lucid though doesn't your conscience like your consciousness have to control it not your subconscious i don't know but we're, we're, we're talking about like some kind of futuristic technology so we can't really i'm just saying like the term it. lucid because like people have lucid dreams all the time yes they do have you ever had a lucid dream yes i have they're great describe it quickly it uh quickly i can't it was too hot (laughs) too hot to handle you you know that it's not real but it takes some time figuring out because it's so lifelike and you you have this power that you don't have in real life but you also are you're you're hyper aware of your entire surrounding and being wait is this you having a lucid dream yes what was your lucid dream about (laughs) that's that's for another day another a different type of podcast because mine was super hot. <laughs> I, I can tell you the one I had that that's the most memorable for me, and I can and and this is will be quick because nobody wants to hear about your fucking dreams, you know. <laughs> you know? So here here's here's that mine. Is, that that is the one constant. The only people that care about your dreams are you and everyone and, else is uh, just like no one else. Well, the, the the first thing the other person thinks is, "Were you fucking me in your dream?" <laughs> if the answer is no, then it's like. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. I can just say this. The dream that I had was where it was a lucid dream is when I realized that I was dreaming and I said, you know what? I'm going to make myself fly. So I made myself fly <laughs> <laughs> and I started floating through the air. But then I got so high in the air, I panicked. I lost control and I just kept rising and rising and rising and rising. And I screamed and woke up. That's my lucid dream. That's you woke up from going too story. high? Yeah, like I, lo- I couldn't control my propulsion anymore. And, and like, I lost. I just started going up and up and up Isn't and up. Isn't usually the opposite, huh? Isn't usually the opposite. You start like I, falling, I, I falling, falling, and it's like you you hit and then you wake up. I'm just better than most people, you know. I just <laughs> no, I go just, against the grain. Yeah, you definitely do. You flying and then rising up. That <laughs> right, let's get well. Anyway, what I was trying to say before is that like when the lucid dream begins, there's a specific scene in the movie when he actually starts dreaming, and if you pay attention when this movie is happening. You hear in the background like a tape rewinding, like and then, and then like all these other weird like wah, wah, like noises like that. Yeah, it's very well done, very subtle, very good. A lot of the stuff in this movie is very subtle. Specifically, I want to talk about some of the acting in it. Penelope Cruz, she did a really good job in this movie. I never really noticed it before, but. Everything she does is so subtle. It's all body language. Like when he talks to her, like the way, like it's, you see it in her eyes and like in the way like she reacts to him. Like you know exactly how she feels. Well, you got to keep in mind this is her second time doing this movie. This is her second time acting as that character. Oh yeah, this is. <laughs> it's like she had she she had another run to do this, so she she got it even better this time. I wanna I wanna imagine. Yeah, she did a tremendous job. Like I was I was very impressed. By, I was impressed. Her performance. I was impressed with all the acting, save Cameron Diaz. Oh, you thought she was the worst? What's your beef with Cameron Diaz? She's a bad actress. <laughs> what? That... Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna allow that for this this movie. What do you think? She wasn't as subtle as the other actors and actresses, but she she was definitely. Fully I don't cool. think she needed to be. Her character didn't demand it. You know, you're not gonna allow it. What are you, a fascist? Yeah. Yeah. This is a all right. This is a fascist, totalitarian. This is a podcast. totalitarian podcast. A fascist podcast. What did you guys think of the different characters being insane? Tom Cruise, Cameron Diaz, and even Jason Lee a little bit when he got angry. They all had like their own like little version of 
being crazy. I, I thought, thought it was all well done. It was different for each person, but they're all different actors and actresses. So it was good. I like that this movie was a, a insight into what it would be like to be insane. Yeah. Like the way things kept shifting and changing. I thought that was, that was pretty cool. Well, is he insane or is he just deranged? I feel like there's a... What's the difference? Yeah. Well, I feel as if being deranged, you're, you still are of... He's of sound mind. He can make rational decision, uh, decisions, but he... He has difficulty understanding what's going on and what's reality. And when you're insane, it, it can insinuate that you have no clue what's going on and you have no capability of understanding what's going on. His decisions are done from his perspective. So to him, they're rational because they're being shown from him. But to everybody else that would be viewing his decisions, they would be insane. He's having an identity crisis where he thinks Penelope Cruz's character is Cameron Diaz and vice versa. And commits a uh, pseudo-psycho murder because of it. Well, for a while, too, you start to believe that maybe he's right, maybe it isn't in his mind, maybe it is the world around him. For a while, I really did think that there was some sort of conspiracy theory. They did a really good job with that. Yeah, the seven dwarves, those people. See, it's those been so people. long since the first time I saw this, I don't, I don't know if I thought that. You can't really, uh, I you can't, can't separate yourself. I can't. And I've seen it so many times, I... I can't tell for sure what I actually thought the first time. I know I enjoyed it, and uh, I know I enjoyed it the whole way through. Okay, well, what would you think of the the genius that is Kurt Russell? Experience the genius, you know? That's what I always say when I, I watch a Kurt Russell movie. I, I can't think of a bad Kurt Russell movie. No, it doesn't exist. No. Yeah. I can't think of a bad one. Yeah, he, he was great in this. Jason Lee, great. He was great. He, he brought the laughs, I thought. He did bring the laughs. I don't like him as a professional skater. No, <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I like him in uh, all of Kevin, Kevin Smith's movies. Yeah. My name is Earl. He was great in that man. Mall rats, Tom Cruise and Jason Lee, Scientology buddies. Yeah. See, I've been, I've been working really hard at separating Tom Cruise's personal life and Jason Lee's personal life from their acting life because I think that's how you should do it for, for, if you I'm take trying, any great artist, I'm trying to. Relate. They're going to have some sort of dark thing in their past. Yeah, and you so, don't. You need to separate it from. Ex- exactly, and I'm like you, you and I, we were both fans of uh, the writings of H.P. Lovecraft, and that guy <laughs> is the most. He was the most racist, <laughs> you weirdo, weirdo, loner, <laughs> asexual robot <laughs> man on the planet. Hey, but, but the man knew how to write a story. So yeah, and and, and these two guys definitely can act very well. Okay, guys, <laughs> what did you guys think? Was the point of this movie? What was the takeaway? What was the moral? Well, they said it themselves. They said it's the little things and that even small decisions that you make can ultimately affect your life. His The very first decision that he made to get in that car was the deciding factor in the entire movie that he was going to become crazy. He literally went into an accident and ruined his entire life because of that one decision. He... he step back from his original no and then after that decided to go into this other life another small decision which led 150 years into the future where the love of his life isn't even in existence anymore and he loses everything or, he, or his, is she i don't know we'll never know what about you what did you think i don't think i can sum it up in one sentence this this movie exists or what they show you is his psyche coming to terms with the mistakes and sins that he's committed and then stepping through them to come to a realization that all his decisions have consequences and they determine who he is as a person. What about that whole thing about the sweet isn't as sweet without the sour? I think that's very true. It is very true. And yeah, everything is relative. You can't, uh, have uh, bliss or enjoyment without experiencing pain or else you wouldn't be able to, you, you, you wouldn't be able to know what it is. Yeah, what but it, he, it feels like. he already had that. He was alone and isolated he, through his inheritance. He said that they saw him as this 11 year old boy. They didn't really respect him and he had to go through life basically on his own. Yeah, but he never wanted to confront it. One of the best lines of this movie is I want to live a real life. I don't want to dream anymore. But when you think about it, his entire life was just it was just like a dream. It was him running away from responsibilities, running away from relationships, not wanting to deal with any possible negative consequence that came from his selfish actions. He just wanted to like live a little dream world where it was all about him. Good insight. 
this this whole movie is him after his death psychologically coming to terms with all of his behaviors having consequences all of his interactions with other people possibly causing pain at his ex- uh, at the expense of his pleasure and it allows him to see his life for what it actually was it puts it into perspective and then he's able to finally take the leap or plunge into the real world in the way this movie ends is all right let me ask let me ask you too what happened in the end of the movie what do you think happened in the end of the movie because the director says there are five possible interpretations of the ending what do you think happened at the end there's the obvious that whole movie was a dream but what did you think happened i thought that he woke up from a cryogenic a, a cryogenic nightmare well, i'm trying to think about it too because they said that he had to die in order to be frozen and i'm trying finding it hard to believe that he can just awaken from death i would assume that you would just be frozen and then you would be unfrozen. So yeah. I'm trying to think about maybe he's... A lot can happen in 150 years. It's true. They said that it could reconstruct his face, but I don't think they could... They said a lot of things dead. were different, like your finances won't last long. A lot but of things are very different. But it's only 150 years. Whoa. Think about what was different 150 years ago from now. We're talking to a bunch of microphones right now with a screen that's about a quarter inch thick projecting imagery that's constantly moving via light waves into Joel's face. I don't think people 150 years ago could have even imagined that. It's true. Technology is something that is ever present and it's throughout the years it's become almost unbelievable in what we are capable of doing, but I still don't think we will ever be able to bring people back from the dead. <laughs> I just don't think it's actually possible. You think that was strictly J man, strictly <laughs> strictly JC. Oh yeah, yeah. He 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 had the gift. He had the touch. Yeah, he had the special touch. Okay, so I I want to believe what the movie says. I want to take it at face value because I really like the idea of him taking a gamble, cryogenically freezing himself in the past and actually having it work out to the point where he can wake up 150 years to the future. I think that's a very cool idea. So here are Cameron Crowe's five possible interpretations. Wait, 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 wait. Before you read that out, I want to tell you what I personally hope happened because they also said that Penelope Cruz's character never recovered. I hope that she froze herself. You can keep dreaming that. It's part of my loose. She's not. Dream. She her character wasn't rich enough to freeze herself. <sighs> Shot you down. She could barely afford her apartment. Remember? Yeah, but what if he left some money to her? Yeah, I, I doubt it. All right. So. It looks like you left all the th- Thomas Tip. You left him a sweet tip. By the way, you know that guy who plays Thomas Tip? Whenever I see him in movies, to this day, I call him Thomas Tip. I'm like, oh, there's there's Thomas Tip. I don't know what his name Thomas is. Thomas Tip was in a movie that we saw two nights ago. King's Speech? We saw the King's Speech. He was Winston Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I saw the entire movie was Winston I was Churchill. Like, I, was like, I was like, hey, Carissa, is that the guy from Vanilla Sky? You're like, I don't know. I'm like... <laughs> He's got a cigar. This Thomas Tip, yeah, Thomas he tip. he was in uh, uh he was in uh, Lemony Snicket. He's he's been in a ton. The Last Samurai, I think. Yeah, he's yeah, been in yeah, a ton yeah. of he movies. Was, he he's was great. In Last Samurai. He was the uh, the English uh, diplomat or, or American diplomat that wanted to modernize the uh, Japanese army, right? Mm, yeah. Okay. So let, let's get back to this. So here are the five possible interpretations of the ending from Cameron Crowe. Okay. Number one. Tech support is telling the truth. 150 years have passed since David Ames killed himself, and everything after his passing out on the sidewalk was a lucid dream. Number two, the entire film is a dream, as evidenced by the sticker on David's car that reads, February 30th, 2001. February 30th doesn't occur in the Gregorian calendar. I guess there's your proof. Number three, the entire film after the crash is a dream that takes place while David is in a coma. Number four, the entire film is the plot of the book that Brian is writing. And number five, the entire film after the crash is a hallucination because of the drugs that were used on David during his reconstructive surgery. I find those other answers to be very unfulfilling to me. Yeah, same here. I want to stick with, uh, I want to stick with my final answer. I want to lock that in. But Penelope Cruz's character still well, there's, alive. There's another question, too, is when he wakes up, he hears the open your eyes. That's definitely line. Penelope Cruz's voice, by the way. Both, both characters You are wrong, by the way. Who? You are wrong. 
the the woman at the end is a completely separate actress and the okay. I, I i know this for a fact because i looked at it in the credits and in the commentary when i listened to it cameron crowe said this is not cameron diaz or penelope cruz it's a totally separate woman fuck so you're, le- been, you're it, led to him Im- it's implied that it is because the very beginning uh cameron diaz sets yeah. it as the alarm clock or whatnot mm-hmm. and then later on uh, as he wakes up from the sidewalk, so both times he's waking up from a dream yeah. and hearing those words. They should have gone something so, totally different. Is like it possible a that man he or something? Is it possible that he could have just went back into a lucid dream again? It's possible. How come I mean, that's how, how come that's not listed? Oh, so like like it's just like a reset where it's like open your eyes and, and he's, 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 he's back, back where he bed. started. He's back in bed. Uh, if you want that interpretation, fine. Well, you know, it's I'm funny you bring this up about open open your eyes stuff. There is a lot of little foreshadowing like that I noticed this time around. So everyone's telling him to open his eyes. A lot of people are saying, "Wake up, wake up, man!" And he also says, "I'm having a dream that I can't wake up from." See, I still don't see why they didn't use the original, um, the original title, Open Your Eyes. Yeah. Like, that's the one thing that I'm okay, most here, pissed about. Here, here's, here's what he said. He said that uh, when he talked about his relationship with himself and Penelope Cruz, he said, we created our own little world together, which is pretty much what he was doing the whole time. So maybe she did freeze herself. Maybe he left a little note. I hope so. See you, you in the future, babe. <laughs> I hope so. You, you know, it was a great quote. Uh, if only Thomas Tip could look into the future and see what's really going on. He goes, people will read again. <laughs> Sorry, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Newspapers and magazines are shutting down left and right. So, yeah. f- <laughs> you know what, though? He's fine because I think David Ames left him a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, he, he deserved it. So, okay, let me ask you guys this question. At the end of the movie, Tom Cruise is given a choice. Do you want to stay in the dream world or do you want to go to the real world? He chooses reality. What would you do in his scenario, Krista? I'd choose reality. Why? I love free falling. I'd totally jump from the skyscraper. No, um, they have to change the fear, so it's your greatest fear then. I'm afraid of heights, but I still Aren't enjoy... You? Yes, I, I still enjoy free falling. It's a, it's a rush. It's good. But, uh... No, I also feel as though, um, why would you want to live in a dream world where people you know in real life would be gone? It's the obvious answer most people have. I'd hope so. You want to live a lie for the rest of your life? I would want to... You they'd know. probably no. They probably would just erase it from his memory so he wouldn't know. That's, that's, that's what they said would happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I probably would jump off the building just to jump off. Uh, but I'd say, can I wake back up as a half-human, half-fox mix <laughs> and marry a bunch of other half human half animal mix people and just have orgies yeah that's very plausible just yes. have like a furry a furry fantasy well one thing too is if forever he, if he forever furry <laughs> if he doesn't remember all that happened when he finally wakes up he'll be able to reconstruct his like say, say what the ending is that the tech support was right and he was able to finally reconstruct his face and not feel the pain anymore he'd he'd be back to the way he was but he'd have no one to share his life with he'd be alone just even more so than he ever was he wouldn't even have his little fuck buddy or whatnot so wouldn't he want to go into another lucid dream well now now he has the opportunity to make his life what he wants a life of his own choosing um he has choice he also wouldn't have an and inheritance would be real. that's true but so he good you should take yeah. that away from him because that was allowing him to his his inheritance and money were ultimately being used in a self-destructive way What's interesting and what I what I had been thinking about for, for a few years now is eventually if if all of these lucid dreams turn into this, and even if they don't, would your psyche eventually get to the point where there's other lucid dreamers that are cryogenically frozen that eventually come to this breaking point where they've overcome all of their personal insecurities in their own lives before they died and then want to eventually wake up and continue? That's a really interesting question. Like is it just like a matter of time where you have a spiritual awakening in your psyche during the lucid dream mode and then just are awakened again? That is a really a, interesting as a, premise. As a f- completely metaphysically realized person. Like these people are trapped in this purgatory where they have to relive these relive. problems. And uh, maybe that's an inherent flaw in the system. Like they try to make, like in the Matrix, they try to make a perfect <laughs> world, but it, it didn't work out. You have to come to terms with all your faults and understand the world that you live in and completely become the person you want to become the person your subconscious wants you to be that would be very cool if the lucid dream option that was like an that was an inescapable definite yeah you're that, gonna... that would eventually happen no matter how long it took hundreds thousands of years you would eventually come to a to a tipping point where your psyche would fight itself 
your subconscious would bring all of these horrible negative attributes and, and sins that you've committed in your real life to the surface and you face them and step through your own shadow and become individualized and, and realized as a person and then you choose to wake up. I like that. That's a really very interesting idea. Chris, I have a question for you. I remember when this movie came out, sadly, I missed it. I didn't get to see it in the theater, but I, I remember sitting in class back in 2001 and uh, that, was, that was still high school, right? You must have been a junior. Or no, I was in college. 2001? Yeah. You graduated from high school in 2001. Yeah, I did. I did. Oh, okay. So anyway, I remember sitting in class and there was this girl that sat next to me. She was talking to this other girl about this movie. She's like, oh, I saw this movie, Vanilla Sky. It's really interesting. And then she posed this question to the other girl. She said, would you ever date a guy whose face looked like that? Chris? I would. I honestly would. I know that some people don't believe it's the person inside, but it's not just that. It's, it's so much more to relationships, the depth of who a person is and what you see. It's sometimes what other people see isn't what you, you'll see. It's not the destroyed face that everyone else sees as a horrific monster. That's all well and good, but where do we draw the line? What if someone was just missing their face? It was just a bunch of holes. It's just like flattering holes. Are like, <laughs> they have cases like that. They have, they have flesh eating. They, they, were have, able, they were able to talk hey, to you like, like hey, what, what, and they, they were like really, wasn't really good. Wasn't Mel Gibson the man without a face? Yeah. <laughs> like what, what if they were great people, but they just don't have a face? Would you still date them? What better if they were decapitated? What if you were to dating the headless horseman? Then not have a soul. <laughs> Would you date the headless horseman? Answer, serious a- questions. Answer, answer serious honestly. answers only. Please. I want. I want some. I, want I, some I would answers rather. Now. I, no, I would rather live. He's not a good person. You know. He's no, no. Let's say he's a great guy. You guys get along great. He was a Hessian soldier, but he's he's oh, he's, shut he's, up. he's, right. he's, yeah, he's getting, Christopher Walken. You know, like. Yeah, he's got sharp teeth. He's filed his teeth down. <laughs> back back to Vanilla Sky. If if say it was it was David, and I had to make the choice. Being that he's a good guy, but he's also crazy, and he has a messed up face. He was in an accident. Would I date him? Plus, he's mega rich. Cash. Oh, fuck yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cash money. <laughs> yeah, that's all that matters. Joel, would you date a girl that had a messed up face like that? Nope. Cold. Uh, I yeah, wanna... see, how, see how long it took me to <laughs> hey, hey. answer that? I want to say I would uh, do it for the person inside, but I'm going to be Wait, honest. hold on, hold on. Caveat. She, her face is destroyed. Does she have a slamming body or what? All right. Well, it's, again, it's, it's different. <laughs> again, again, hold I, on, wait. I can look past it. I can look past these things. I have actually um, a real personal experience with this is that um, my- You dated a man who had like a messed up face from a car accident? <laughs> no. Not no, saying you, I you wouldn't. You drove the car off the cliff? <laughs> you drive the car off the cliff? No, actually, um, <laughs> one of my family members when she was younger was in a fire and her whole body is covered uh, in scar tissue. And you did. And I had no idea. I never realized until someone told me. And I was in my teenage years. I really did not realize that she was disfigured. And people, and after being told this, I would go around and people do stare but it, you can look so you can look past it you don't see it as these scars you see it as this person you don't see it as a flaw really i i still think she's beautiful and i'm not going to say what it is cuz you know but in all honesty the person she was with stayed with her and disfiguration is all within someone else's own mind you could see that and just be like oh it's just a scar that sounds great it sounds great <laughs> but i don't i don't know if on i on paper it's, yeah, it looks good on paper, but I'm not gonna lie about this. I don't. I don't think I would date a female David Ames. Their face was messed up like that. His face isn't that messed up. Like in the very beginning, it's all bruised, but once the swelling goes down, it's it's just some cuts in the fit in the, hey, his face. It shocked that girl in my class. She wanted nothing to do with uh, that. She's like, "Nope, I would not date a guy like that." <laughs> I listen. I want to say I'm not shallow, but shallow. But I am, so deal with it. <laughs> okay, let me let me liven this up. Uh, let's, let's get some uh, some fun facts about this. Oh boy, these, some I'm of waiting. these fun, some of these fun facts are pretty crazy. Like, okay, are they fun? Oh, that you are going to have so much fun. You're not going to know what to do yourself. In the scenes with McCabe interviewing David in the prison cell, the word "dream." can be seen written backwards on a blackboard in the background. That's fucking cool. During a quick montage of stills at the very end of the film. Montage. 
Spanish? One of the shots, which lasts for only one frame, is of Dr. Pomerantz, David Ames' plastic surgeon, flipping the bird at the camera. That I knew. I knew that because I've watched that montage a bunch of times. Mm. And the last scene is supposed to be him with his mother going back to like a very maternal okay. for his psyche. Oh, wait. Speaking of which, where was his mother the entire movie? She died, died in a car, car crash. The, both of them died in a car New crash. New Year's Eve. Drunk driver. <laughs> oh, that's true. He did say that. Uh, and uh, this is, this is the, the fun fact that had my head spinning. Okay. When David is arrested, the plaque on his photo lineup reads W eight five nine four nine four T eight five four R five one five blah 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 blah. That's a cryogenic tube number, isn't it? No. Some <sighs> elementary code breaking reveals that it says When did the dream become a nightmare? How the fuck is is how, how is that a code? Because <laughs> <laughs> if you look at four R five one M, it kind of looks like dream. So wait, it was in Leet speak. I, yeah, yeah. Shut the fuck up. There are two other coded messages mentioned on Crow's commentary on the 3D X-ray of David Ames' skull. To the lower left of the skull, it reads four O N zero blah 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 blah. It says, "Do not wake him up." To the lower right is the message P L five one S blah 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 blah. Or please, p- pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams. All, Interesting. All in lead speak. Yeah. See? Fun fact. So everybody that played World of Warcraft or SOCOM, who was in the ground floor for uh, for lead speak, was able to read that. Yeah. They, <laughs> they took one look at it and they were like, oh, oh, when did the dream become a nightmare? <laughs> yeah. yeah they, That's they, they it. I got it. <laughs> I played SOCOM. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. So do you have anything else you guys want to say that you want to add? Toss onto the pile for uh, Vanilla Sky? I thought it was a great movie. Loved it. Everybody's hot. You get to see Penelope Cruz's, uh... <sighs> yes. You get to see her breasts. She is one of the most beautiful women in the world. That is That's. I'm going to say it right there. All right. Cruz and Cruz, power couple. Right? All right, They, they fine, dated fine. after let's, this, right? They did, but let's, let's, get down to, uh, let's get down to business here, because every podcast where there's a lot of attractive women in it, we break it down. So. Who is the hottest? So let's let's break it down. You got Cameron Diaz, Penelope Cruz, Tilda Swinton. Tilda Swinton looks <laughs> looks <laughs> her, her, the most her, androgynous woman her, in the world. Her and David Bowie would have the again, as I've always said, the most androgynous and pale baby to ever live. To ever live. I think this is the first movie I'd ever seen Tilda Swinton. Who knew that she would rise to power, and I I would see in, her all the time and everything. Who knew that she'd be Gabriel and Constantine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that amazing movie. What a great movie. I love that movie. Okay, so, yeah, there is no question. It's P- P- Penelope Cruz, hands down. Did you know that Cameron Diaz did softcore porn before she made it as an actress? Is that true? Fact. Can you back that up with facts and figures? You're the one who's got the... Co- you got your uh, your hand on the keyboard right now. I can look it up, but I'm going to choose to believe it's true and just spread the myth <laughs> in, 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 into the world. Hey, check check this out. Kate Hudson turned down the role of Julie Gianni, while Maggie Gyllenhaal also auditioned. Can you imagine those two being uh, instead of Cameron Diaz? I don't want Maggie Gyllenhaal. Kate Hudson. I would take that. No? No. No, 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 no. I don't want Cameron Diaz in that role. You know who was originally, who originally auditioned for Jason Lee's role? Who? Jared Leto. Really? Yeah. There's one thing I have to ask you guys. Did, when you... I don't know if you remember when you first saw the movie, but did you uh, feel as though one of the characters did not exist? Because after one point, I was led to believe that uh, Penelope Cruz's character was not even real. No, I always thought that every character in the movie was real. I could see why you you would eventually probably come to that conclusion. I mean, though. real in in his real life, not in the, just not the dream. Not in the dream. Mm, no, I, I thought that they all existed in his life, um, with the exception of tech support. I thought he was fake. Actually, I remember watching it the first time. I, I remember thinking that the that uh, Noah Taylor's character was like very out of place in the continuity of the story of the movie, and then it's revealed that he's not even supposed to be there. No, I, I, I don't think I ever had that idea. I thought he was just insane. I think the first time I saw this. Okay, guys, before we give our final take on this movie, let's hear what the critics had to say about Vanilla Sky. Donald Monroe from the Fresno Bee says, In the end, this hard-to-classify film is little more than a cheap parlor trick. 
Kirk Honeycutt from The Hollywood Reporter says, As pretentious as it is preposterous, Vanilla Sky needs its own wake-up call. Eric D. Snyder from ericdsnyder.com says, It's really just a lot of whacked-out psychological mumbo-jumbo. And Stephen Hunter from The Washington Post says, A case of the vein leading the bland. Whoa. Ouch. Burn. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, Martin, this movie has a 40% on Rotten Tomatoes. The critics did not like this movie at all. What did you think? Vanilla Sky, is it really that bad? I don't think this movie's bad at all. It's one of my favorites. I'm going to say that the acting's great. It's, it's a beautiful movie. The story's great. It's entertaining. And, you know, I, I think it's uh, pretty blatant from the amount of times that I've, that I've talked about seeing it that it's that that i enjoy it i've settled on a four out of five for this movie and and every time i see it i enjoy it a little bit more excellent uh Krista, what did you think is it really that bad i don't think it's bad at all i think that they are very judgmental towards this movie for absolutely no reason you get a lot from it and uh i would give it a four out of five as well i find that the soundtracks were amazing i found that the imagery was just phenomenal and that the acting aside from Cameron Diaz as we were talking about before was amazing I I liked it and I liked the ideas that it portrayed and left you wondering at the end Joel what did you what did you think about this movie I do not believe it's that bad I think this movie is very good I love this movie actually four out of five is what I'm going to give it I feel that in the future, as I get older and I watch this movie and I see different things and have a different take on it, it might get bumped up to a five, I think, uh, in the future. I don't know. I'm hoping that that day comes. Yeah. I mean, this movie is just so well made. Like, it's so layered. It's so deep. It's so rich. There's just so much going on behind the scenes and all this stuff. It's like a lot of different things you can take away from it. It's just a really well made movie. And if you're a sci-fi fan... It's a must. I think you have to see it. It's one of those secret sci-fi movies that just sneaks in. Like, you don't know that it's a science fiction movie. Then all of a sudden, boom. So kind of like from dusk till dawn. Like, yeah. if, you had, if you had no idea like, what that movie was about, you'd be shocked by and it, where and it goes. And it's believable, too. Thank exactly. You. So, this movie is a must. From dusk till dawn is not believable, but... Well, that movie's a must, too. <laughs> that, that's, that's a really that, good movie. That's a fun movie, but this movie is believable. It's great. This... It, it's it's up there with Gattaca as far as sci-fi goes, in my opinion. Yeah, it, it, this movie has something to say, and it's very interesting. Definitely check it out. Definitely recommend it. Don't listen to the critics. This is definitely one of the cases where the critics are wrong. This is a perfect movie for this podcast, I think. Yeah, because yeah, it's not bad at okay. all. Okay, great. Great job, guys. Four out of fives all around. Everybody loved it. Amazing. Perfect. Unanimous. All right, guys. Let's go get some dinner. Yeah. Woo! All right, so next week, I'm going to give you the choice that I never had. (laughs) I said something a vampire would say to you. My father never. (laughs) All right, uh, uh, I got two movies that I want to watch. That are an immigrant father. Yes, I'm going to let you decide what you want to watch. You take your pick. Freddy Got Fingered, starring Tom Green, or Gamer, starring Gerard Butler. Take your pick. I choose Freddy Got Fingered. I knew you would. Okay, so tune in next week when we will be watching Freddy Got Fingered, starring Tom Green. See you then. Thanks for listening. Be sure to visit yeahitsthatbad.com, where you can listen to previous episodes, and you can also subscribe to the show so you won't miss out on any upcoming shows. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for an upcoming episode, you can send us an email at yeahitsthatbad at gmail.com. You can also leave a comment on this episode's page, and you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. But most important of all, if you like what you just heard, please tell your friends.